this work. It's the tray way, huh? Uh, D A N I E L space H E R N A N D E Z. All right, good afternoon. Speak. I'll ask you to keep your voice up and speak slowly and distinctly for the benefit of everybody in this large courtroom. Counsel, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, how old are you? 23. You're older. You go by any other names? Yes. What are those? Uh, Takashi, uh, Takashi 69, um, Picks. Yeah. Mr. Hernandez, where were you born? Uh, Bush, Brooklyn. How far did you go in school? <sighs> About the 10th, uh, 11th grade or so, like that. What? Mr. Hernandez, are you currently in federal custody? Whoa. Yes, sir. Approximately when did you start living in federal custody? Uh, about no, uh, November 18, 2018. What were you arrested for? Uh, racketeering charges, um, you know, uh, violent crimes, shootings, uh, drug distribution. At some point, did you decide to cooperate with the government? Yes. When did that happen? Uh, a day after, um, November 19th, the day after uh, we, we was taken down. In connection with your cooperation, have you pleaded guilty to certain crimes? Yes. What crimes did you plead guilty to? Um, I believe it was uh, nine counts of racketeering, um, shootings, uh, and, and drug distribution. You listed racketeering as one of the crimes to which you pleaded guilty. Were you a member of any gang? Yes, sir. What was the name of the gang that you were a member of? Uh, the Nantre Bloods. Nantre Blood. Approximately when did you become a member? Uh, around, uh, I would say November of 2017. What sorts of things did nine trade members do? I'm sorry? What sorts of things did nine trade members do? Uh, we participated in a lot of, uh, you know, violent crimes, um, robberies, assaults, uh, drugs, sorts of that nature. Mr. Hernandez, do you recognize anyone in the courtroom who was a member of Nine Trey when you were a member? Yes. Who do you recognize? And if you, if you can identify that person, uh, could you identify where they're sitting in an article of clothing that that person may be wearing? <laughs> Uh, Hall, Anthony Ellison has a gray suit on. Um, uh, and uh, Nuke Ajumai Mack has the brown suit on. With the white thing on his head. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the uh, witness has identified Mr. Mack and Mr. Ellison? Yes, the record reflects that Mr. Um, um, Hernandez, in sequence, uh, uh, identified uh, Mr. Ellison and then Mr. Mack. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Hernandez, we'll turn back to Nine Trey in a minute. Before we do, I'd like to ask you some questions about your life before Nine Trey. Where'd you grow up? Uh, I was raised and lived in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Where'd you go to school? Um, for elementary, I went to PS59. Uh, for middle school, I went to Walmart Campos. For elementary, I went to PS59. Uh, middle school, Walmart Campos. And uh, high school, for the time being, I went to Legacy High School. Legacy. Yeah, Legacy High School. Did you work? Yes. What'd you do? Uh, I started working at the, I want to say the age of 13. Uh, my first job was at uh, the Greenpoint Youth Court. It's a job that handles like misdemeanor cases for youth. Um, 
where the youth acts in like a bailiff, judge, jury, youth advocate, community advocate type of thing. I did that about for two months. I'm not, uh, Mr. Hernandez, I'm gonna cut you off. I think you are uh, speaking so close to the mic that you're blurring some of your words. Maybe move back a tiny bit to the mic and keep your voice up and keep speaking slowly. Thank you. Uh, so I did that for about a year. Uh, I didn't make a lot of money doing that, so I started working with my brother. Uh, busting tables. I did that for about a year and a half. Then uh, I landed a job at a grocery store named Stay Fresh and Grill, where I worked as a delivery boy. I did that uh, about for two years. Uh, I worked up to register. Shortly after that, uh, I landed another busboy job. And then after that, became a rapper. So you said that you started a music career, is that right? Yes. Approximately when did that happen? I'd say around uh, 2014. Uh, and, and how did it come about? Well, at the, at the store I was working in, um, Stay Fresh and Grow, um, there was a guy under the name Peter Rogers, always, always come in there, buy a tea and like a tilapia, some peanuts, stuff like that. He asked me if, uh, if, I, if I made music and if I rapped. Uh, and I was like, no. And he was like, well, you know, got the image for it, you look, you look cool. I was like, you know, I took it in consideration and we started making music um, from the from the deli. And, and again, this is around 2014? Yes, sir, like late 2014, like September. So when you started making music in around 2014, what type of music were you making? It was more of a, like a rock and roll uh, rap. Approximately how many records or songs did you release? Uh, eight, I believe. I believe around eight. Did you go on any tours? Yeah. Where did you tour? Uh, Eastern Europe. Um, I toured in uh, Bratislava, Slovakia. Bratislava, Slovakia. Uh, Prague, Czech Republic. Brno. Czech Republic, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and uh, Moscow. Were you making any money at this time as a as a, as a metal rap performer? Um, I mean, for all those shows, I made about like two thousand dollars profit. I, I did it just for the experience. Now, Mr. Hernandez, did there come a time when the type of music that you recorded changed? Yes. Approximately when did that happen? Uh, around, uh, it, it changed in September of 2017. Uh, uh, directing your attention to September 2017, did there come a time when you filmed a music video in Brooklyn? Yes, sir. Where in Brooklyn? Uh, Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, Brooklyn, um, on Madison between uh, Tompkins Avenue and True. Do you remember the address? I believe I want to say it's 370 Madison. 370? 370. <laughs> Ms. Horney, can we please pull up for the witness what's been marked for identification as government exhibit 202? This shit right now crazy. Mr. Hernandez, do you see government exhibit 202? Yes. What is that? 370 Madison. Is that a photograph of 370 Madison? Yes, sir. Does it fairly and accurately depict the way 370 Madison looked? Yes, sir. Your Honor, the government offers government exhibit 202. Any objection? None, Your Honor. No, no objection. Proceed. May we publish it, Your Honor? Yes. So you filmed the music video in, in front of 370 Madison? Yes, sir. What was the name of that song? Gummo. Gummo. G U M M O. This morning we can take down the two girls too. Come on, fire. 
Mr. Hernandez, how did the filming of Gumbo come about? Um, around August of 2017, uh, I, made, I made the song Gumbo. Uh, Check it out now. I'm here, people. I'm here to break down what the heck is going on in court. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, Takashi 6 9 been on the stand for the last two days. And to be honest, I got to give an extensive recap of what the heck he's saying. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed yesterday, I got some audio. You guys listened to it before I even spoke. But I also want to kind of go over the transcript, okay? I'm going to go over some of the major parts because it really drags on for a while. But essentially, he gets called up to the stand finally after the first day they selected the jurors. Second day, they interviewed like some hairstylists. And then the second person they call, which is a lead and star witness, is Takashi 69 Now, what you will hear and what you do hear in the beginning of the audio is basically the prosecutor establishing factual basis basically here's the job of the prosecutor for this whole case they got to show and prove to the jurors that 6ix9ine was a regular citizen then he became a blood that there's a distinction when he became a blood he was a part of like this gang now he's a part of the gang he's a part of the gang with not only the defendants who allegedly then kidnapped him later on but with shoddy and everybody else who those two guys who kidnapped him was later on beefing with so basically they got to go step by step it's kind of really boring at first but it picks up really fast it's kind of like a movie okay so they ask him about where he goes to school i mean they ask him about his jobs and pretty much they talk about his early career now, it kind of picks up with the gang stuff when they start talking about Gummo. He signed supposedly a 20% management deal with Seiko Billy, and pretty much that's when things kind of went on the up, right? Gummo, he got 20% deal with Seiko Billy, which is obviously at that point some type of management, all right? Now, here's the thing. Because after that, he's saying that's when he met Shadi, right? And he says that point they kind of just said, yo, you're kind of part of the gang. Now, the judge and the prosecutor is saying, okay, well, did you get jumped into the gang? Like, how the heck did you get into the gang? And he's basically saying, no, I just had to provide money, and I'm in the gang. They also played a lot of his music in the courtroom the first day. I mean, they're, they're pretty much, like, going over the videos. They're saying, yo, is that a real gun? Also, keep in mind for everybody who's questioning, like, yo, why do you have to say this? He has to be truthful. He lies one time. Whatever deal he struck before he testified is off the table. Now he had to explain what a drum gun is, what an extra clip. He had to explain some of his lyrics. And, I mean, he then even brought Chippy Red's name up. Now, a lot of people say, yo, why he bring Chippy Red's name up? Now, let me explain to you why he brought Chippy Red's name up, okay? He has to explain why some of the crimes were committed. One of the crimes that were committed, he was never charged, nobody was ever charged, but proven that these guys who are now the defendants used to be like not only gang with them or be muscle with them, he has to show people that, yo, they used to put in work for me. One of the people they put in work against was Trippy Red. Allegedly, Harv punched Trippy Red in the mouth like when it was supposed to squash beef at like some hotel. So essentially, he has to then say why he was beefing with Trippy Red. Now, he says Trippy Red is a five five star brim or five nine brim i think the 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 gang is and a lot of people said i was doing too much listen you got to realize he's telling for extra credit he's hoping that the, the that the prosecutor is so happy with how he does that at the end of the day he could probably get like a year or a year to three years in prison still he cannot lie on the stand i keep having to say that he had to mention Trippy's name because Trippy name comes up later in trying to explain to the jurors what the guys who used to be cool with him did for him. They beat up a guy. Who they beat up? Trippy. Who is Trippy? Trippy's a rapper that was signed to the same label with him. They became rivals. Jealousy, blah, blah, whatever you want to say. And Gummo or Kuda, whatever it was, was a diss song to Trippy. Okay? Now, he kept continuing in terms of like mentioning why he named certain songs certain things like Kuda was named after a rapper called Kuda that's probably going to come up later because Kuda again did a shooting for him against Chief Keith now they're playing parts of Kuda really talking about like and really to show who is from where like hey which area is this and who's the guy there you feel me so pretty much that's how it starts out now 
What I will say as like the the, the day continues because it's really long. It, it, he said he never had to cut no one or stab anyone for an initiation. He just had to buy guns. But then he said that the trade off was that he got his career, credibility, and protection from Treyway. In return, they got money. Now, he had to demonstrate what the handshake was of Treyway. The, the nine trays, gangsters, handshake. He had to do it with two people. He told the prosecutor that. Of course, they weren't going to be like, yo, one of the gang members go up there and give him the handshake. So he did it with himself. So pretty much he has to show the jurors what a handshake is. Keep in mind that the, the jury is a bunch of middle-aged white, possibly women, right? And they don't know what Treyway is. They don't even know what gang member is or, or, or being a gang member really is. Or, like, what would identify people to be in a gang? So they, they're getting a tutorial as we go. Yo, there's gang signs. This is a gang sign. Yo, I do stuff for them. They do stuff for me. We are under this, like, this umbrella of this gang, right? So pretty much there's a handshake, right? He continues that basically that he got scolded one time for not throwing up the sign, right? And one of the guys who was actually on trial taught him how to do the sign, okay, now, he also has to identify people in pictures, because there's mad pictures where niggas throwing up gang signs, he just has to say, yes, this guy's ranked this, this guy's ranked this, basically, he's, he's basically, uh, um, cooperating and, like, confirming the, the, uh, prosecutor's story that all these niggas were in a gang together, right, he has to talk about a leadership structure, Yo, there's a street lineup, and this is, he gets really in depth. There's a street lineup, there's a prison lineup. And they ask, how the prison lineup go? He says, pretty much, the, the prison lineup controls the street lineup. Because the prison lineup was a higher, there was higher ups to get anything sanctioned on the street. Now, you know, there's times that there's overrulings, and like, of course, the, the, the defense attorneys are like, yo, whoa, whoa, chill, 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 yeah, he's saying too much, you know? But the prosecutor's trying to get the meat and potatoes out of 6 9 Pause. Now, Pretty much, he breaks it down. He says, there's godfathers, there's twins, there's five-star generals, okay? Uh, 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 apparently, like, there is, like, a few lower ranks before the generals, but there's one star to five-star, then there's twins, godfathers, and godfathers to the highest. Now, he started naming people. So, yo, Mel's the godfather. Right under him was Shadi. Seiko Billy was right on the Shadi. He's a five-star general. Now, at that point, it, you'll see pretty much, um, and, and also... He started to he started to kind of like give a sense of what the relationship with Shadi was because he said Shadi told him who kind of brought him in helped him through the gang ranks I guess Shadi said yo if you take care of people in prison they'll take care of you at that point the first day ends okay now provided some audio. I'm going to come back in a few minutes with some more testimony, which was from day two. But I'm trying to help you guys break down and understand what the heck is going on. It's really confusing at first. But when you kind of understand it with some context, it will make sense. Salute to the guy, Inner City Press, who's like keeping up with everything. If you guys want to see live reaction, I did like a five to six hour stream today. And I reacted to every tweet. I gave a lot of information, a lot of like, like personal stories that may help you understand stuff. I do that on Twitch. However, just for right now in this video, this is what we saw the first day. My next video, which is coming out really shortly, that's where stuff is gonna get interesting. You guys should tune in. Make sure you like, hit the subscribe button. This is gonna get very long. And we're gonna see, by the way, this is one of the very interesting things that happened. And I, I didn't say this before, but you heard it on the clip. Um, when he first took the stand, he admitted he, he, like they said, when did when you start living in federal custody? When did you start cooperating? He said the very next day after he got locked up. He said the day after we were taken down. That's really big and really important because it tells you few things, right? It tells you that the plan all along. Because remember one time his attorneys was putting out, oh six nine's not cooperating. He's not cooperating. Clearly they already started to cooperate. So it shows you the level of how his cooperation is when he started to cooperate. And I mean, you can make the argument that I don't know if he really took a fair shot at really going at it with the law rather than just saying, y'all got it. But you find out things like that in the first day. The first day, right? And by the way, he had to point out the guys in court. He said, so-and-so is wearing so-and-so, like colored jumpsuit. So-and-so is wearing so-and-so colored jumpsuit. He had to do it all 
He could not say no. He couldn't downplay it. He couldn't try to lie or try to like, okay, let me speak indirectly. He has to speak directly and tell the truth. And by the way, if you were cool with him pleading guilty, this was part of the plea. You had to get on the stand and point things out if you have to. Again, I'm speaking with some passion, but don't mean I am co-signing or saying this is great or cool or acceptable. You guys know my relationship with 6 9 He's a cool guy. But this is some street stuff, and this is the ramifications of street stuff. And this is the reason why we're seeing where we're at right now. Anyway, tune into the next video. It's dropping actually in a few minutes where I'm going to explain what happened in, in um, day two. And you're going to see that this is a movie. It's a biopic. It's something that, to be honest, I asked the people who are watching my stream today. I said, yo, what's more entertaining? What you're finding out, like tweet by tweet or play by play or power. And to be honest, people couldn't believe what they were seeing. I got videos and everything that came out in court that you'll see for the very first time in my next video. you got to hit subscribe, hit the like button, make sure you like and share. It's more academics. Boop.